Well, thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed my deep uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, that pleasure is derived not uh, just simply um, because I love you all so much, um, but because of my, uh, my deep and uh, long abiding uh, respect and um, love for Dr. R.C. Sproul and for what uh, God has done uh, through him uh, in his, uh, his work and his ministry and his equipping of the saints uh, for so, so many years. I thank you. And uh, so it's a pr privilege of me to be here. I'm, uh, I usually uh, tell people and make sure they understand a, a couple things uh, ab about me. I'm, uh, I am not a speaker. Uh, I'm a teacher. And you have been, uh, you have been blessed with some giants uh, here this weekend. Uh, in fact, I was speaking to, uh, yes, that's true, they are giants. A man came up and, and uh, reminded me of that, and uh, he said, I've been coming here for years um, because these are giants. And then he looked at me, and I thought he was going to ask me why I was here, and <laughs> because I, I almost was going to finish the sentence for him, it just seemed appropriate to say, and and you are like a grasshopper, and, uh, and I feel like that in the presence of, of these men. But I'm not a teacher. I'm a, I'm a speaker, and uh, there's a drastic difference between speakers and teachers. Speakers have a, a well-honed narrative that they have worked on. It is finely tuned. The words are exactly right. Uh, it is geared to take us to the height of emotion and then drop us into the pit. And uh, they take us to a point of, of laughing, and then they move us to a point of crying, and then there are some times when we don't know whether to laugh or to cry. And then just as the, as the clock is reaching the, the precise end of when the speech is to close, they bring us to this great crescendo, and we rise to our feet in oration, Teachers aren't like that. <laughs> we just simply teach until the bell rings, and then we quit. <laughs> and, and that's what we're going to do here tonight. <laughs> because, you see, really, I'm not, I'm not interested in moving you emotionally. I could care less about moving you emotionally. But what I care about what I deeply, deeply care about is the transformation of God's people. And that is the, that's what's been driving me since uh, the, the Truth Project actually was birthed uh, in, uh, at, when I was at the White House. And uh, I won't tell you that story, but it, it came as a result uh, primarily of reading the, um, the writing of the pilgrims, the, the, the early founders, the Puritans. Um, and I began to realize that they had this comprehensive view of life. And it, it, it was a biblical view of life. And that doesn't mean they were perfect. They were not perfect. But yet, they carried this, this understanding and this depth that they, that they presented in their writings and everything, everything that they, they professed was that God had spoken in every area of life. There was no inch of ground that they did not see as being Christ's. And I realized that I didn't have that perspective. And I soon grew to understand that that was called a worldview. And I began to reread Francis Schaeffer and reread all of these these great people who, who were professing and trying to help us understand 
what that worldview was that God had given to us, the privilege that we had to see that truth of God as it applied to every area of life. And it was there that I began to be deeply, deeply burdened by the fact that as we look across the body of Christ in our culture, in contrast to what I was reading back here, and again, not that they were perfect, but the contrast was so great, so deep, that I wept over the state of the body of Christ, that we had lost uh, the vision, we'd lost the perspective, we'd lost the understanding, we'd lost that grandness of the truth of God in all aspects of life, and therefore we had shrunk Christianity down to a small slice of life. And because we'd, we had shrunk it down to that small slice of life, we acted as if God were irrelevant in the other 350 degrees of life. And we were no longer salt. We were no longer light. We didn't look any, any different than the rest of the world around us. And we had conformed to the pattern of the world. And so Romans 12, 2 became a, a, a key passage for me. God, as he was moving Paul to write, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, be metamorphed. The Greek is, is not just a, you know, the word transformed is so overused today. I saw not long ago about... Uh, you were talking about a guy who had been transformed by changing the, the grip on his golf swing. But the Scripture uses that Greek word, metamorpho, in a very judicious way. It's used in the Gospels when we hear about Jesus being, and we translate it, transfigured. You recall? Metamorpho. It's used in the, in the Romans 12 passage that I just quoted, and it's used in 2 Corinthians 3, where it says that we, with unveiled faces, are all being metamorphed, metamorpho, transformed into the likeness of Christ. This is not a minor word. This is a deep meaning word. This is not just getting a new pair of shoes. This is not a new do. We're not talking about a little dab here and there. We're talking about a deep transformation. It's a metamorpho. Oh, that's where we get the word metamorphosis, and it's where we describe what happens when the little wiggly thing… Have you ever th thought about what has to happen to that caterpillar? It is a radical transformation that occurs. It is the metamorphosis that occurs. And so I, I was overwhelmed by this, this deep uh, remorse and sorrow that the bride of Christ was no longer acting the way God had intended us to act. And therefore, it was not a surprise when we looked around the culture that we were not having the impact upon the culture around us as Christ had intended. And so, I have, from that moment, I have been called with that deep passion to see the people of God healthy and strong again. And that is what's going to drive uh, my remarks uh, to you tonight. So I'm a teacher, I'm not a speaker, I, I usually do not accept speaking engagements. I, I would rather uh, go and spend a weekend at a men's retreat. I'm, I'm not as comfortable up here. Uh, I would rather be, if there were stairs here, I'd, I'd rather be down. I'd rather be interacting. I often thought if God called me to be a preacher, I'd probably freak everybody out. 
because I, there's no, I would, I, w- I want to interact. I love to do that. I love college students. Uh, that's where I, I spend a lot of my time. I hang with them, and, um, and I love to interact with them deeply. So I'm interested in what is going to happen here in terms of you thinking and to, um, to consciously uh, keep yourself from falling into the mode that is so easy for us in our culture to do, and that is to fall into a passive mode. My friends, when we hear the Word of God preached, when we hear the Word of God teach, uh, taught, we should never be in a passive mode. We should always be in that mode of wanting God to reveal Himself to us in the truth that He has so graciously given to us that He might do something within us. I'm fascinated uh, and, and have uh, tried to look over and over again at those moments that the Scripture gives to us in describing what happens when the frail uh, human being uh, comes into the presence of God. My favorite is Isaiah 6. I'm, I won't go back there with you, but remember when Isaiah comes into the presence of God and he says, woe is me, I'm undone. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. God exposes us. When we come into His presence, He exposes us. And it's not some, it's not some mystical thing. We're going to talk about that tonight, that, you know, the truth of God is not just some mystical kind of a thing. It is the reality of who God is. And somehow in the presence of God, it's like the reality of who He is exposes us. I am so glad God is so gracious that He doesn't expose everything about us when we come into His presence. Otherwise, we'd be crispy critters. But when we come into His presence, which should be this constant uh, hungering for Him, drawing near to Him, and, and He will expose those things within us. Every day, we need our our feet washed. My friends, we live in a culture that bombards us constantly with the lies of the world, the flesh, and the enemy. And it's easy for us to begin to squeeze ourselves into that mold of the world. But God graciously will expose that to us, and He will expose the culture around us. He will help us to see and understand that all of the cheap paint and the loud music that the world will plaster over itself to help us understand and hear the weeping and the moaning and the groaning that's going on behind the walls to help us understand why our culture is in such a mess. And then that moves us. When God says, whom shall we send and who will go for us? To say, here am I. Send me. I know, my friends, that's what we need today. We need the people of God, healthy and strong, armed with the truth of who God is, and believing it with such a depth, with with such a deep belief that it's really real, that we would be like Jeremiah, who would say, I can no longer keep it in. If I do not speak, Jeremiah said, his word becomes within me a fire, a fire in my bones. Oh, that that would happen to the people of God. So the title that was... uh, given to me when worlds collide. I don't know what that really means. <laughs> this is some astronomical event that occurs. But I think I understand the meaning behind this. 
You see, physical worlds aren't really colliding. And we have nation will rise against nation. Uh, we have uh, human beings who rise against other human beings. We have those, we have those conflicts. But you see, it's not, that's, that's not the real conflict. The, the real conflict is between com, uh, conflicting and contradictory truth claims. Your truth claim is that you own that land. That truth claim says, no, we own that land, and you have a conflict. There are many, many worldviews. Uh, these uh, worldview is a, is a set of truth claims that purports to paint a picture of reality, and we have many of them. A lot of the formal ones: secular humanism, Marxism, Islam, Christianity is a formal worldview. Truth claims. Each one purporting to say these are the truth claims that. Tell us what real reality, this is what reality is. But obviously they can't all be true because they're contradictory. And when truth claims contradict, we have a conflict. So there are many worldviews that are in conflict, but, but I want to talk about what I think the biggest conflict is. And I want to present this to you tonight not as something where we would sit back and, and look outside of us as an examination of a worldview that is in contradiction to a biblical Christian worldview, but I want us to examine ourselves, and quite frankly, I will examine myself. If you want to listen in, help yourself. So the subtitle of, of this is Rejecting the Meta Narrative. And the consequences that come from rejecting the meta narrative. I want to read uh, to you a quote from a gentleman who is considered to be one of the founders of postmodernism. I carry this around with me because I happen to believe that this is one of the most negatively profound statements that we have today because um, this quote is summarizing and expressing what I, th I believe is one of the fundamental problems that we see in all conflicts. Jean-Francois Leotard. Can you imagine being named Leotard? <laughs> now again, he is he's speaking. Um, let me read this to you, and I want to uh, I want to parse it for you just briefly. Simplifying to the extreme, simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodern as incredulity toward meta narratives. Now, what is that? Well, it's not that complicated. Remember, he said he's simplifying. Simplifying, he says, to the extreme, I define postmodern as incredulity. What is that? Incredulity is, um, it, it's not just um, a, a rejection, it's a scoffing rejection. It's a scoffing rejection toward meta-narratives. We already talked about the prefix of meta, it's this large, the large story. 
So what he's saying is that if you, if you shuck it all down to the core, postmodern is, in, is essentially a scoffing towards any sense that there is a larger story. Now this, of course, is more recent, but I would, I would submit to you that what he is speaking is not new. We call it new because it has the word postmodern in it, but postmodernism is not really new. It's as old as the hills. Now, since we don't really know how old the hills are, (laughs) it's as old as the beginning of time, plus some period of time. Because I would submit to you that this is exactly what Satan was doing when he spoke to Eve. God had already expressed to Adam and Eve the larger story. Satan says that's not a good story. In fact, that story is in essence an attempt to oppress you. You could be so much more than that. You could be so much grander than living in that story. Let me give you another story. Let me build for you another narrative. Let's see if you like this one. So what is the meta narrative? So let me, let me continue the, um, the definitions for you that are given to us in postmodernism of what a meta narrative is. Hang with me here. The meta narrative, as uh, postmodernism would define it today, but I, again, I would say this is nothing new. The meta narrative is any large story, and this is expressed from uh, those who um, are scoffingly rejecting the notion of a meta narrative. The meta narrative is any large story, any large story that pretends to give an all-encompassing explanation of anything, especially an overarching story of history and life in an attempt to legitimize some version of truth. I may not have spoken it to you in the scoffing tone. Maybe I should restate it for you. The meta narrative is any large story that pretends to give an all encompassing explanation of anything, especially an overarching story of history and life, in an attempt to legitimize some version of truth. This, my friends, is exactly what causes us to begin to believe that there is something more appealing about our own script. There is some promise here that my script is going to lead to my happiness. My story is going to bring me Contentment, satisfaction, significance, happiness, whatever. And I would contend that we do this every day. And, but the question before us, the question before us is, do we really believe that there is a meta-narrative, and that that meta-narrative 
is a good meta-narrative, even if it brings hardship, pain, suffering, rejection, and all of those things that we have a tendency to try to write our script around. Let me read to you the, the um, if it's, it's really wrong to um, rate passages. You know, it's just not good to do that. Because as soon as you rate one at the top, you're certainly open to the accusation that you've left out another one that is surely bigger than that. But let me, I want to give you a passage that to me is one of the grand, grand passages in all of Scripture. God is speaking in Isaiah chapter 46, beginning in verse 9. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. From the east I summon a bird of prey, from a far-off land a man to fulfill my purpose." What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. What a remarkable statement. It declares that there is a meta-narrative. There is a grand story. There is an overarching story. Now, some may ask, well, yeah, but what if it's not a good story? What if it's not a good plan? That's what Satan was saying to Eve. Eve! That's not a good plan. How about this one? Or this one? You and I are presented with a million different plans to choose from. It costs a little money, but you can buy happiness, you can buy fame, you can buy fortune. Now, it doesn't work out, of course, but that's that's a minor detail. This is the meta narrative. Jeremiah 29 11. Now, I know before, this is a very astute group. I know that. And I know as soon as I say Jeremiah 29 11, some of you say, oh, oh. That was a statement that was made for Israel. Okay. Maybe, maybe not. But I want you to listen to the fact that God is speaking to his people. And God never changes, so though this may be a promise to Israel, if you want to make that case, it still reflects, as we'll read in Philippians 2 in just a second, it still reflects the goodness of God. For I know the plans, here we are back to this notion of a plan, of a purpose. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you. And this is not in the prosperity gospel kind of thing. This is, this is in the overarching uh, plan of God, in the heart of God that he creates, he equips, he empowers, he sets free to flourish, to be fruitful. I know the plans for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope 
and a future. You will never have hope, you will never have a future if you do not live in the larger story of God. You may think that you have a future. You may think that you have a hope with your script, but I guarantee you it will never work out. Never. I'm sorry, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to myself, remember? Philippians 2, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Do we believe that? When trials come, when the bottom falls out, when the oncology report returns, when our son becomes a prodigal, fill in the blank, do we believe? Really, do we really believe? that the meta-narrative of God is the best plan and that His purposes are really good. I want to I drop back for just a second and, and, and build a little bit of foundational things. I don't know how in the world we got uh, to be this late, but let me give you three statements by Jesus that, that help us understand the notion of truth, because we're dealing with, we're dealing with the reality of, of truth. We started the truth project with the question, why was Jesus born? Why did He come into the world? There are about 18 ways you can answer that. The Scripture will uh, uh, tell us that Jesus came for this, Jesus came for that, but there's only one place where Jesus said, this is why I was born, and this is why I came into the world. And it was Jesus making that good confession, as Paul refers to when he's writing to Timothy, when, when he says that Jesus Christ, while he was before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. And by the way, uh, you know, we live in a world of world inflation. Marketing has inflated many of our words. You know, good really isn't good. I mean, nobody advertises a product and says, this is a good car. Well, you wouldn't buy a good car. No, you have to buy an amazing car, a stupendous car, whatever. Good is no longer you know, worthwhile. But when God says it is good, it is good. And so the Spirit of God moves Paul as he's writing to Timothy, he says that Jesus made the good confession before Pontius Pilate. And it was there where Jesus declares, for this reason I was born, for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth. Listen to me. Why, why did Jesus make that profound statement? Because, my friends, this is the battle. This is the conflict. This is the cosmic battle, the battle between truth and lie. It began in the garden, or some might say it began when uh, Lucifer fell, when Satan fell. But for us, it began in the garden, and it continues to be the battle today, the battle between the truth of God and the lies of the world, the flesh, and the enemy. In this case, the God who says, I am going to work all things together for good for those who love me and are called according to my purposes. For the God who stands before His people and says, I have plans for you, and these are good plans. Three things, quickly, to answer Pilate's question when Jesus made the good confession and Pilate said, what is truth? That's why postmodernism is, isn't new. Now, the Greek doesn't really give us the inflection and so forth, but I don't think, I don't think Pilate was saying, oh, what is truth? I think he was saying, what is truth? 
And he turned and walked away. It was a scoffing notion that there's any absolute truth. So how do we answer this question? Let me, let me give you three uh, quick uh, ways that you can deal with answering this question. Now, I, we, uh, in the Truth Project, we obviously lay down uh, what I think is the proper uh, answer to this question. Um, it, we, I, I skimmed it down a little bit from the, the proper philosophical understanding that the truth is, according to the correspondence theory, is that which, that which perfectly corresponds to reality. I just cut it down and say, truth is what is really real. Truth is what is really real. But let's examine it from, from three statements that Jesus makes. Profound statements, actually. When Jesus says, I am the truth, remember when he said, I am the way, the truth, and life. I am the truth, that Jesus in that statement is declaring that there is something about truth that goes beyond just some uh, propositional thing that's written here and there. It goes deeper than it goes to the transcendent nature of God Himself. That truth is transcendent. Truth is eternal. Truth is absolute. Truth is universal. Truth is un unchanging. It is immutable. Truth is exclusive. Because Jesus says, I am the truth. He also said, I am, there is only one way. It is exclusive. It is ultimate reality. Jesus was really real. Non-contradictory. Jesus is not, there's no contradiction within the character and nature of God. When I was flying here uh, yesterday, I was in, uh, flew from Colorado Springs to the Houston airport, and then uh, was running from, uh, from the gate uh, in southern Texas to the gate in northern Texas to catch my next flight, and as I was running by, I saw this, one of those big, huge uh, things, uh, advertisement, oh, oh, this is not an advertisement, it looked uh, like some philosophical statement or something, and I'm running by, and there was a, a little girl, a cute little girl, and, uh, and, and the words across the top said, I am powerful. And by that, I said, I need to take a picture of that. I didn't have time. What do you think about this? A worldview that loses touch with reality and begins to build a worldview based upon what we want to be true is it is a worldview that would, would put a statement like that on the picture of a little girl. Now, maybe this is conflicting for some of you. This is, oh, oh you know, a little kid, I want my little girl to think, I'm powerful. You know, there's nothing wrong uh, with helping our children understand that they are special. God made them. There, there's nothing wrong. I, I wouldn't have a problem if it said, I'm special. Uh, that's okay. I am loved. Well, that's okay. I am powerful, a little girl. I did glance back to see if maybe she had an Uzi, you know, under her, <laughs> you know. Maybe she had a belt with grenades or something. I don't know. It's possible. Who knows? No. Is it just a, a little girl? I am powerful. What kind of nonsense is this? I remember uh, several years ago, I was, I was in... Uh, uh, a store, and, uh, and a little girl walked by, mom was right next to her, a little girl had a t-shirt, and on the t-shirt it said, it's all about me. I thought, boy, I'm glad that's not my little girl. <laughs> but you see, when you lose the meta narrative. If we listen to the lie that says, no, no, there's a better story for you. In fact, you can write this story every day. You can write your script. 
It's all about you. It's all about you. I am the truth, Jesus declared. Truth is transcendent. Truth did not, not emanate from me. Truth did not come from my passions. Truth did not come from what I want. I want to be powerful so I can say I'm powerful. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, 75 times. He's on the witness stand. That means that truth is propositional. Truth is objective. Truth exists. It can be expressed. It is knowable. We can know it. Truth is not just some mystical thing, some ethereal thing, you know, that floats like like smoke over the heads of philosophers as they sit in the tower smoking their cigars. No. It's really real. Third, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was… He, Jesus finished the Sermon on the Mount with this story. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them, may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock, and the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and burst against that house, and it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. Whatever hears these words of mine, the truth, and does not act upon them, will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and burst against the house, and great was its fall. That's how the Sermon on the Mount ends. Truth is consequential. There are consequences associated with how we respond to the truth. It's pragmatic. It's actionable. It can be rejected. But when we reject the truth of God, there are consequences. Remember King Uzziah. King Uzziah was an awesome king. Reigned for over 40 years. He was a teenager when, when they made him king. If you read 2 Chronicles chapter 26, you'll see that the opening parts of that chapter talk about how Uzziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. How many times did you read that about a king? Not many. It says, he sought the Lord all the days of Amaziah. And then it tells about all these mighty things that Uzziah did. And then we get to verse 16, and everything changes. Remember the story, Uzziah? It says, but when he became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. Let me jump ahead here real quickly and tell you, one of the consequences of losing sight of the meta-narrative is pride. I know what's best for me, and oftentimes for you. So Uzziah thought he had the power and the might to breach the sphere of the church and to walk in as the king and to offer incense. Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. David lost his son. Elijah lost his position. Remember, he's on the mountain. Remember? He's got the poor me's. Why? Because it didn't go according to a script. He had a script to how this supposed thing work. It's not turning out that way. He's hiding in a cave on the mountain. 
The guy says, what are you doing here? Well, I'm the only one left, you know, and they're da 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 You know, and then the lightning and the thunder. What are you doing here? Well, da 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 Lightning, thunder. What are you doing here? Oh, blah, blah, blah. And God says, go appoint your successor. Moses struck the right twice. Things weren't going according to script. And, and he didn't get to take the people into the promised land. There are consequences associated with defying God and His truth and His design, that meta-narrative. Man, if you fail to treat your wife in the way that God has designed for you to treat your wife, there will be consequences. Okay, we only have a, a minute here left, but let me, I want to run through. Dr. Uh, Dr. Moeller gave you 14 consequences for the noetic fall. <laughs> I have 44. At this point in my class, what I would do is I, I would say, I'm going to give you three, and tomorrow I want to see the rest of them. <laughs> Get you to think. Here's what happens. And let me tell you, my friends, this is what is happening to our young people. I'll describe to you exactly what is happening to our young people today. They have been raised in a world that says it's all about you. It's all about your story. It's all about your script. It's all about you. And do you know what happens if you begin to believe that? If you're wearing a shirt that says it's all about me, I know that you've got a shirt that says it's all about me. And the person sitting behind you has a shirt that says it's all about me. And pretty soon we all stand down and say, it's all about me. And we live then in a world filled with manipulators. Everybody is a salesman. Everybody's trying to manipulate you to enhance their story. And I'm telling you, my friends, this is how they view the world. They're not stupid. They've been taught that it's all about me. And if it's all about me, then I know it's all about you. And I know you are simply trying to get me to enhance your story. It's all about my story. By the way, that's what Facebook is. You know what Facebook is? Here's my story, and I want you to love it. This leads, my friends, to the death of relationships. I think it's one of the reasons why we see young people not getting married. Why? Why get married to somebody who's just trying to get me to enhance their script? If I do get married, I'm going to marry somebody I think I have the power to force them to enhance my script. That never works. Ladies, it will never work. And you already know that because you tried. <laughs> and men, so have you. This leads to isolation. This leads to alienation. This leads to um, a rejection of authority. It leads to loneliness. Not long ago, we were in a, we have an open forum after class. I love that time where 
where the students can go and get their food and come back into class, and then it's an hour of potpourri. Whatever they want to ask, we're going to talk about it. It's, it's an amazing time. I love it. And we were in, engaged in a conversation like this, and, and it led me t- to this point. And I, and I said, you know what? Let me tell you something. It's sometimes dangerous to say, you know, that you are a special generation of all generations, but that we know this is, this is absolutely, absolutely true. You are the most connected generation in all of human history. You're the most connected generation in all of human history. You have your, your cell phones. Uh, you're, they're, they're like a part of your body. You're constantly uh, talking or, or texting. Some of you are texting right now. And they're like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so you're the most connected generation in all of human history, but you are also the loneliest. And you could have heard a pin drop because they know that it's true. Why? Because the lie pulls the rug out from underneath true relationships, which are built on sacrifice, and have atomized us. When we don't find out that we can't get people to honor my script, it results in anger. By the way, next time you get angry, next time you get angry, ask yourself if it's not because somebody just stepped on your script. (laughs) It leads to hatred and bitterness because somebody ripped up my script. A loved one dies. That's not part of your script. And that bitterness leads to depression and despondency and a lack of hope. We'll finish with this. What has that got to do with the Christian mind? Everything. Everything. Because when it comes to those moments, and they will happen, every once in a while, even you may get up and write your script for that day. And even you may have someone trash it. The question is, are you going to base how you walk on how you feel, or are you going to base how you walk on what you believe is really real? Do you believe that what you believe is really real? That Isaiah 46 is a true statement about the reality of all of life, that God is able to carry out His good purposes even in the midst of the most tragic circumstances. In the garden, Jesus showed us three times. He went before the Father in what had to be the most agonizing moment that any human being has ever endured because he knew that he was going to face a moment when the Trinity would be ripped. And yet he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Not my story, your story. Not my script, your script. He did it three times. I think he did it three times because Maybe he was even in the midst of his agony. He was again being an example for us that we must continually give up our script. Enter by the narrow gate, 
For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. You know what's written on the broad gate? The sign that says it's all about you. Happiness. It leads to destruction, my friends. You know what's written on this gate? You must die to yourself. It's all about him. The last word is this, and that is that the Puritans had a remarkable statement. It's a statement that is not one that is good to tell someone in the midst of suffering, but the Puritans would say this, oh, you might, when someone was suffering through some kind of trial, they would say, oh, you must be highly favored of God, that He would allow you to go through this trial, that you might glorify Him. Oh, my friends, every time we get caught up in our own little story and gripe and complain and grumble and mumble and get angry and honk our horn and all those things that we do, we declare to the world around us that it's not really real. Oh, that we might be a people that would be so filled with the absolute belief and a surety that God's Word is really true, that it is yea and is yea, that we'll live our life in such a way that there will be people who begin to ask us for the reason, for the hope that is in us. Oh, Father, I confess before You how often I believe the lie of the flesh it's all about me. It's all about my story. It's all about my script. If I could just get my way. Oh, Father, forgive me for losing sight, for rejecting the meta narrative, the larger story, the reality of who you are and your promises, your decrees, your goodness. Oh, Father, forgive me for my weakness. Help my unbelief that we, Father, may glorify You in the bottom of the pit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.